All right, welcome one, welcome all. I am Michael Everard, and today we're going to have another conversation from the Spirituality and Science series. And this is a new series that I started about a week ago with David, by the way, and um, it is part of the Sight Sound Spirit group that I encourage people to participate and post anything about spirituality and consciousness and perception and religion and, and faith and philosophies and any school of thought that pertains to just better understanding our reality. So uh, today um, we have David uh, back with us and then we also have a new guest, Halim Rodriguez. If you would like to introduce yourself Please do so and just take it away. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So yeah, it's Alim Rodriguez. And as far as my background, it's it's interesting because I I was raised as Seventh Day Adventist from my mother, which is a it's a it's a kind of Christianity that maintains a lot of the Judaic beliefs as well. And but I had been a lifelong practitioner of martial arts. My father was an instructor. My uncle was an instructor. So I grew up. My earliest memories are doing martial arts and things were happening as a result of the training. And it led me to ask questions about uh, where does this come from? How is this possible? Where does it lead? And it led me to early studies of things like qigong tai chi and then internal alchemy and then into the deeper studies of of the taoist and the and the buddhist teachings and it led me to some extraordinary teachers who introduced me to I, the best way that i can compare it is similar to the western occultism but not um, it's a it's a the tradition is called Sushinto Mahoryu, and it is a blend of mysticism and magic. And so it is not really a religion. It is not really a faith in that regard. It is a process that we take. And we, we have the symbolism of the traditions that they're born from as ways to explain our experiences and to describe the process that we use. So it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting blend of a scientific approach to spiritual endeavors. And uh, to me, that really, that really drove my, my interest because as a martial artist, I was, a, I was extremely practical. It's one of the things I think that martial arts really instills in people is, you know, uh, there's a certain amount of fantasy that a lot of times people have is, uh, if this happened, I would do this until it actually happens and they realize they're extremely ill-prepared and nothing that they thought they would do actually came to be. And so you translate that sobering reality into your experiences of the, of the spiritual traditions and, and you start to find that it's, it's cause and effect, all of it. You know, you do this and you do it right, and you're going to get an outcome. And, and it removes all the guesswork. I apologize for laughing. I was just laughing because yeah. um, I, I believe that causality reigns supreme, that, that everything has a cause and effect. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. David, please uh, reintroduce yourself to anybody that has not seen uh, this series as of yet. All right. <clears throat> um, I have a... Well, how I came how I came to be a Buddhist. Um, by the way, I'm David Chentavong. Uh, at first, I was a Baptist Christian for you know a good half of my life. You know, the younger half of my life. Um, my parents sent us to Sunday school, not knowing that it was Christian. Um, they were new to this country as well, and you know they just thought it, it would be a good thing for you know moral development or edu they thought it was educational kind of, but. <laughs> Little did they know that we, we turned into Christians after that. And a lot of things did not make sense later on. Um, as I, you know, as I continue to question uh, a lot of these teachings that are being preached in the church. 
So uh, me, my brother, and my sister, we all kind of fell out of that. And, um, you know, I, was, I did a lot of soul searching, a, a lot of truth seeking, and I stumbled upon Buddhism. And my parents are already Buddhists, you know. They, they never taught us Buddhism, though. Because they were just regular people, regular lay people. My dad, he was, he did spend three years in a monastery in Laos as a Buddhist mm. monk at a very early age. And, um, you know, that was kind of my inspiration, too. He was also a soldier for the King's Army in Laos. And oh, wow. I was also a soldier myself well, for the U.S. Army. So we have a tradition of... Uh, um, a monastic tradition in our family to be a monk and a soldier, kind of. So, yeah, I stumbled. I can't. That's upon, quite a, quite yeah. a duality there, yeah. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> I I was a soldier first before I became a monk, though, because you know if I was to do that backwards, I'd be repressing. But yeah, I came upon uh, Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, by the way, it's the original teachings of the Buddha, um, the oldest and most accurate. So yeah, as I, you know, I did a little soul searching and truth seeking before that. And a lot of it resonated with what was already in Buddhism. I was already practicing Buddhist teachings without even uh, knowing it was Buddhist. And, you know, um, well, Buddhist teachings aren't just, uh, it's, it's not just only found in Buddhism. A lot of it is also, you know, there's a common thread in all the religions really, mm -hmm. you know. But there are a lot of teachings and disciplines that aren't found in other religions as well. And that's exactly why I appreciate it. It's all about your consciousness and how, how things come into being, creation, right. existence. It provides a very thorough and detailed explanation of it. And it has everything to do with energy turning into matter uh, in a quantum physics explanation kind of way. So, yeah, um, good. thank you for having me. This is episode number three. And... I'm happy to be here with Alim and Michael again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I learned so much from Naminder. What was it? The day before yesterday, and yeah. I had I, I honestly had no idea what Sikhism was all about, and the parallels between Sikhism and Buddhism was like, oh my gosh, it's like. So um, it was so refreshing to learn about a new religion. I had heard about it, but I never, I never, I never knew anybody to even begin the conversation to, to understand why and how people that practice that faith are so peaceful. I, I had experienced them years ago uh, as a kid. Lots of times when we would go to Disneyland, I would see families that, that had the, the, the Sikhism, uh, yeah. right. And I just, I just thought it was cool. It's like, Oh, wow. You know, what a happy family, you know, right. I, I didn't even, I didn't even really wonder what religion it was. I just thought, uh, I just thought about how much they are enjoying their experience at Disneyland. So it was really, really fun. Um, I feel like those that go down these paths of better understanding reality are peaceful warriors. And um, while you were talking, um, Halim, I was thinking about two things. Um, I was thinking about a movie called Peaceful Warrior uh, with Nick Nolte that I highly recommend. I don't know if either of you have seen that movie, um, but it's, it's quite insightful. Um, the second thing, uh, and I wanna tell a little bit more about myself, um, for anybody that's new to uh, this series. Um, my name is Michael Everard. I am a philosopher. I write about consciousness, perception, reality, basically anything pertaining to consciousness, uh, spirituality, religion, science. I, I love quantum mechanics. I am enjoying basically this whole experience from every single perspective which includes every interaction and my background is is english i i have a degree in english a bachelor of arts degree and one of the things that i did while obtaining that degree is i used a, a skill called critical analysis that allowed me to sort of 
find the deeper meaning by interpreting the, the writings or the stories of various pieces of literature and coming to my own conclusions, not even worrying or wondering too much uh, about what the author intended to describe, um, I, I was able to sort of come to my own realizations and obtain and process the information in my own way and therefore uh, basically relate to the author's experience as being very real, regardless of the format, science fiction, poetry, nonfiction. I mean, all of it is really just a way to express our thoughts and our feelings. Sometimes we're going to be um, very logical and we're going to uh, have a format of nonfiction where we describe actual events and we're still using our perceptual skills to understand sort of how those things came to be. Um, the other thing that came to mind in regards to something that I used to practice, I used to practice Aikido. I did it about 18 years ago, 19 years ago for about a year. And then a couple of years ago, uh, I, I got back into practicing it and I only lasted a few months because I have vertigo and the, mo the motions are just like, you know, I would get nauseous. <laughs> so the last lesson that I learned from um, the sensei that I really admired the most, he taught, he taught me that Aikido is uh, something you can practice in everyday life. It doesn't necessarily require um, a physical confrontation because it's really a matter of recognizing that all forms of energy are a gift and you have the ability and actually the opportunity to, to blend and merge with that and harmonize and then resolve any sort of dissonance or conflict that might be what the other participant is feeling. And I, 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 do my best to be mindful of my ability to practice Aikido. And I don't always think of it in terms of Aikido because what I do with all of the experiences, I, I, I start with recognizing that everything that I experience is basically information. And the purpose of information is to transform and to illuminate and to to expand. So, um, Halim, what are, what are your thoughts on, let's say, consciousness in terms of its role in understanding what is occurring in the reality of the observer? Yeah, I, first of all, I got to say that I, I completely agree with you in terms of the role of martial arts and and not from the same paradigm that a lot of people might think. Essentially, from our perspective, we look at it as in terms of a physical modality of experiencing how to transform chaos into order. And so that comes in many forms. Is it chaos from within? Is it fear and hesitation? Is it desire to want to do something that you think is cool? Is it, you know, there's so many emotions and attachments and things that you struggle with and so the partner that you are are practicing with is really your best friend at that point because they get they serve as a mirror and in that experience it's a very isolated uh example of what we experience in the everyday life the world itself is a mirror because we don't really see it for what it is we see it for our capacity to understand and that tells us more about ourselves than the nature of what we're looking at and I think that in the in the idea of consciousness and the nature of consciousness in this and in our experience of it, you know, there's all these different realms and there's all these different types of experiences. And we're looking at it normally through object subject, right? There's the observer and the thing observed. Mm -hmm. And that implies a separation. And there is a, a certain state that you get into that mirrors meditation, martial arts practice, and everything else, where those lines start to blur and the separation of 
object subject is not so clear. Hmm. And there becomes an observer who watches the interaction between the two and as if it's a third party. So it seems like a step backwards at first, right? So how is it more unified when you add a third perspective, right? But the third perspective is putting us in a position where we're not participating in the polarity of it. I love and that. So the polarity resolves itself and then all three of those things become one. It yeah. it becomes a it becomes a triunification or a trinity, if you like. Right. And you see that mirrored in every tradition across the world. There's this form of trinity that shows up time and time again in every tradition, in, in every culture. And there's there's a lot of reasons for that. It has to do with our experiences of things, right? And and even just in consciousness, object, subject, and then the observer that can that can is experiencing the interaction between the two or witnessing the interaction between the two. Question, and, and then I want to hear from David. Uh, uh, you talked about the mirror. And one of the things that, that just sort of popped in my mind is that while we can um, appreciate the interaction with our partners in these conversations and exchanges of information, we are always reflecting our own energy and therefore we are projecting that energy. So a projection is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just what happens with our perception. We first uh, receive and refract and then we're going to reflect how we feel about the experience. Um, I recently encountered, and David's gonna know, uh, what I'm talking about. I recently encountered a very interesting interaction and series of conversations that involved a cracked mirror, as it were, because it seems like regardless of the intentions of an observer, if, if they purposely try to confuse and deflect and create more chaos for their own enjoyment, it seems like there comes a time when you can just decide that the conversation has come to a point of termination and let go of that particular being and just <clears throat> allow them to do their thing. Um, so with that, and also with the idea of being disciplined, um, David, give me your thoughts, if you will, about what it means to be disciplined or devoted, and are they the same thing? Um, they're, they're slightly different. Well, disciplines are a set of rules that you apply to yourself so that you won't fall into lower states of consciousness or being. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're quite different from, uh, well, disciplines. Disciplines are daily, daily, daily things that you would apply to your own consciousness that you would practice every single day. Like saying, if you're trying to purify your mind, for example, that's a discipline. Uh, any thought that comes through your mind, you swipe it away internally. You you erase it. So you continue to do this uh, repetitively, 24/7, or some people do it all day, all night. I mean, even while they're sleeping. I mean, you, if you get to that certain level, some of these monks could get to these levels, and you wake up, you're pure, you're pure mind, heart, whatever. So um, the thing about discipline is you won't come to no attainments, higher attainments, unless you apply zeal. Well, zeal is pretty much diligence, you know, the energy that you put into whatever, the passion that you put into something that you would like to uh, experience or attain, that energy. It's not quite passion, but yeah, you do put passion into uh, purifying 
uh, practices. When you put that same amount of energy into it, you come to your attainments much faster, much quicker. Um, that's uh, <clears throat> that's a that's a very critical thing in uh, Buddhism when you when you are trying when you are practicing these mental disciplines. You do it with zeal. Okay, you can't do it like you know one one hour out of the day or so. I mean, you could if you want, but your attainments will come a lot slower. How about that? That's that's just science, and you know what I mean. That's how things actually worked out too. So, um, <clears throat> that's what I have to say about discipline. Uh, what was the other one again? I'm sorry. Um, well, it it was it was basically that's it. Um, discipline and being devoted. Are and you the devotion. Yeah. yeah, is it seems like devotion is sort of like maybe. To be devoted is is basically a bigger picture thing, whereas a discipline, disciplining yourself, like you said, is is to pay attention to certain rules or practices yep. um, for uh, for your betterment. And I like that you use the word attainment. I never really thought about that and what that word means. It seems to me that an attainment is not just um, it's, it's an acquired it, skill or uh, an unlocked uh, skill that you never had before because you just removed one of the uh, one of the khandas or one of the sankaras probably from your own consciousness. Once uh, these obstacles are being removed little by little, uh, you come you come to have more attainments through sensory perception, through Mm. Um, mental perception to observation to reflection uh, every, everything improves once you uh, come to these attainments and you have to apply this uh, this energy called zeal and diligence I love that in, in accordance with these practices so um, devotion is also actually an attainment and depending on which school of thought uh, you are speaking about Tibetan Buddhism I think uh, Padmasambhava he said your prayers won't be answered because you do not have attainment or you do not have devotion. You have not attained devotion. Um, so devotion in, in a sense, uh, it is something that you acquire and attain through study and practice, through disciplines, you know? And once you have attained uh, devotion, um, all, the other, all your other practices pretty much opens up more doors for more attainments through more practices. Um, it it seems it seems to me that an an, an attainment is uh, parallels or correlates with uh, levels of awareness. So if if you just obtain the information and you don't take the the time and you don't invest that zeal or the, uh, the disciplines required to process that information to a point of, of, of resonance, then, you know, and, and I think that's what it means to, you know, uh, the whole idea of, of knowledge is powerful, but if you know something and you don't share it, have you actually learned what you were meant to learn from that knowledge? I don't know. Yeah, um, you have still learned, but whether you decide to teach someone else or not is totally kind of up to you. Yeah, you'd be kind of looked down upon for that too. Even in Buddhism, they look down upon monks that attain enlightenment and don't teach nobody. I have a right. name for that. I can't really think about it at the moment. Oh, funny. Those are kind of like these uh, <laughs> these shady Buddhas, Buddhas or something that's kind of similar to that. Yeah, they just don't want to teach nobody. They just want to stay in a cave and disappear and go into a light. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a name I, for that. I don't yeah. know why I find that so humorous. Uh, Helene, let it's me ask you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Helene, let me ask you, um, and, and this is where I'm going to get a little more scientific. Um, I think, uh, and, and, and share with me what your thoughts are on this. The beauty of martial arts is that it actually employs kinesiology, which is the study of motion. And it seems like as you practice, let's say certain moves and they become a part of you, 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 you don't just memorize them, but you know how to use them and when to use them. You've, you've, you've taken 
what might seem to be a lot of disorder and you've made sense out of it. So for example, if I walk into a dojo of a martial art that I have not yet practiced, let's just say it's, it's karate. And, and I sit there and I look at a chart, let's say, of let's say all the different, um, all the different moves. And I know there's a name for the moves in karate, but um, if, I, if I were to just like look at all the different moves and think to myself, oh my gosh, that's so much information. How am I ever going to memorize it? Instead of um, beginning to listen to the, to the sensei and, and practice the moves, um, what, what, is, what is your take on the spiritual aspect of the scientific uh, properties of, of motion? Uh, yeah, so if we were to look at the idea of the martial arts and all the different techniques and all of the different moves, as you said, the Japanese term, or my training comes primarily from the Japanese traditions, it would be wasa, right? So wasa is the, the techniques. And the thing is, is you have form and then you have an essence. And that's the thing. In the beginning, you can only learn by mimicking and studying and practicing form. Over time, you do it until the form dissolves and you understand its essence. And mm. as a whole, what you're trying to do is awaken the wisdom, the intelligence of the body itself. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, it is not your mind who is trying to plan what you're going to do about a situation because it's, the mind always operates from analysis. So it needs to observe what's taking place, compare that information to what it's learned before, make an assessment, and then spit out a result. It's far too slow in the dynamics of something that's happening real time. It's not effective. So you have to tap into an innate wisdom uh, that it exists within the body and harmonize yourself with it. And there's this merging between what you've learned and the essence of movement. And what happens is the thinking stops there is a quiet observation that takes place and the body begins to move. You start to see things because we're, when we put ourselves into an act of thinking, we are looking at what they might do, what we think we might do by as a response and what the outcome might be. None of that exists. It's all illusion. We're trying to imagine what may or may not be. And as a result, we're usually wrong. And so we experience failure. And so the answer to that is to stop making assumptions and simply observe the nature mm. of reality that's in front of you. And when we put that into the spiritual traditions and we're looking at how we, how we interact with our experiences on that path, then it's kind of the same. We are tapping into an innate wisdom that exists apart from the analytical intelligence of the mind. And in doing so, we begin to touch upon the essence of the situations with the essence of the teachings and the essence of the experience and understand that all the forms become illusory by nature. You understand the nature of the forms because you understand the essence from which they come, right? So you understand all the different forms inherently because you've tapped into the essence. But if you only look at the form, you can, there's times where you might be able to see how one thing relates to another, but many times you can't. And that's, that's not something that can be taught. It's something that has to be experienced. And so that's what a lot of the practices, at least uh, in my experience, in my training and all of that, it requires that we ask more questions, not for the sake of finding answers, but to understand how to be the, how to have the state of consciousness that is the observer asking questions as opposed to seeking to have an answer. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I, I just, and again, I'm thinking, uh, I, I, I couldn't help but think of wave particle duality and something that I've been thinking about and spoke about earlier in my presentation in my group was uh, and is the idea that wave particle duality exists in everything. So the, the wave is uh, the invisible form that moves the information. And then the particle is 
the observable format. So before you can merge and blend with the spiritual essence of non-physicality, which is basically light being sound, that's another concept I'm working on, is the idea that you, uh, in order to be the, uh, the observer from a position of, I call, um, uh, I call it neutral observational perception. And what that means is we have the ability to find our zero point energy. And then from there, we can do basically whatever observation we require to better understand what we're seeing. And sometimes that requires us to change the angle at which we're viewing that subject. And if we know that we have the ability to change our perspective and then readjust the perceptual lens, now we're talking because it, it really, um, it does require focus. It requires uh, an observant being to pay attention to the present moment, specifically how we feel. The other thing that I have sort of thought about and, and have changed from a belief to, to a knowing is that humans have the ability to know only one thing for absolute certainty, and that's how they're currently feeling. Everything else is the illusion, is the, you know, the, the, the physicalities the, the, the particles and the events that are presented for our benefit, as opposed to the idea that reality is happening to us or the victimhood idea where, oh my gosh, I'm being punished, you know, sort of these um, ideas. Um, David, what is, um, what is your take and how do you correlate Buddhism, as far as, let's say, certain practices, and maybe even go into the Eightfold Path a little bit, if you would, and, yeah. and how, how do you relate the Eightfold Path to uh, sort of a, a format or means of understanding why the Eightfold Path is beneficial? All right. So um, why people do uh, ritual practices and, and religious practices, is these, are, um, these are events designed to kind of generate and focus your energy, uh, the pure energy, and um, pretty much use it to empower yourself and the surrounding environment, including the people involved inside in the ritual too. So that's why uh, rituals take place or that's why people or a spiritual tech practice takes place because it's a, it's, it's a concentration and arousal of uh, arising energy that uh, transforms uh, the negative karma into positive, into, you know, eventually the nothingness if you get that high uh, into practice. The Noble Eightfold Path, yes. Um, why is this important? Because uh, this, this is pretty much the, the blueprint of mm. spiritual practice in Buddhism. You know, it, it requires you to have right mind. Now, right mind, uh, that, that is only thinking of good things, uh, ways to help people. Uh, that includes spiritual practice that, uh, or mental practice that involves clearing the fetters and obscurations and obstructions inside your consciousness, which are uh, sankaras. Me and Halim actually we're talking about this the other day he brought it up and it kind of reminded me to talk about it you know in the previous video in this video so it's very important now sankaras this is this goes into mindfulness sankaras they're pretty much preconditioned formations phenomena um compressed compressed energy if you will you know um oscillated energy that is compressed in phys physics terms you now Right mind, right speech. Uh, obviously, you know every, If you correct everything in your mind first, everything else follows. So the, mm. the number one in the noble eightfold path would be would have to be mindfulness, because uh, you could you could practice either one of these, 
but they all require the mind to practice. Okay, right speed, right 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 speech, right action, right livelihood, which is what you do for a living, uh, what you do for your everyday, you know, procedure to make a living, or how you conduct yourself in, you know, social environments and stuff. You know, right livelihood. You don't want to create no negative karma. You don't want to create no negative speech, no negative energy. So you're always you're always doing the right things at all times. You know this is the noble eightfold path. Um, you follow it to a T. Now every single day, it, like I said, it has to be installed in your consciousness, and you'll you'll be uh, in a pure state of consciousness. Uh, you know, in, in no time. Like I said, you have to apply some zeal to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you don't apply zero, like I said, if you don't put the same amount of energy as you do in saying like uh, the same amount of energy you put into making money, put that energy into, uh, you know, your mental discipline, your, your attainments will come really fast, super fast. Um, and yeah, the noble, if you, if you, if you stick to uh, the noble eightfold path, you'll see, you'll see what's right and wrong pretty much. You, you'll see what's right and wrong in society. You'll see what's right and wrong in uh, people. You'll see the mental formations. You'll see, you'll see the, the karmic, uh, the karmic creations and things. Mm. Okay, karma, you could pretty much, I need to stop saying that. Okay, karma, you could say that it's physical density. That's what uh, in Jainism is explained as as well. It's physical matter or karmic matter that attaches to your soul. And it has many levels of dimensions too. It exists. Ah. Karmic matter exists in many dimensions. It gets less dense, less dense, less dense. That's why these beings are able to fly in other dimensions too, because the density is a lot lower. So, yeah, uh, very, very important if you are a Buddhist practitioner to remember to follow the Noble Eightfold Path and observe. Uh, the five precepts and you know you have to recognize the three marks of existence as you were talking about as well which is dukkha suffering um anatta no self and anika impermanent those are the three marks of existence and that's what actually identifies us as being into existence the existence in itself is considered suffering all altogether in buddhism because in existence is pretty much physicality density karmic matter you know you can identify existence by uh the, by the senses by seeing light by seeing dark by feeling this by hearing this uh mental formations thoughts are considered mental formations mm -hmm. by the way they're not real they're also illusions actually this whole reality because it's not considered permanent is considered illusion anything that's yes. not permanent is considered an illusion yes the only thing that's yes permanent is impermanent it's like you said the nothingness, which of that is, uh, you know, nirvana. So, uh, oh, I never, I, you know, that just, that just finally clicked. You know, I've, I've thought about nirvana and what it is and what it isn't. Okay. All right. But that idea of, of nothingness, because nothingness really just means pure non physicality, because it is the physicality that can do various things, it can either cause pleasure or it can cause pain if you want to look at like like absolutes yeah, and yeah. and Definitely. and both both of those so obviously pain it's easy to relate pain to suffering okay we get that there's 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 physical pain there's mental pain there's emotional pain okay great there's also something that i discovered and and, and i would consider it spiritual suffering and it's it's still just a concept. Um, what what I've come to understand in regards to physical pleasure. Oh, that's, a really that's a very real thing. What's that? Oh, I agree. There, there is such thing as spiritual suffering when you're yes. soul. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 physical pleasure is also something obviously that can become an attachment. And, and I'm thinking back to uh, what uh, Naminder taught me. He taught me uh, about the, the five thieves and the uh, five virtues. And um, I'm not going to talk about it because I still haven't 
studied it enough to know um, all of them by heart. However, I am also reminded of the seven deadly sins. And I think all of these things, um, e even, even the Ten Commandments to a certain extent, are offerings. Um, we, can, we could call them guidelines. We could call them rules if you like. However, I think it's just more um, of an offering or a, a suggestion. It's like, if you do this, the consequence will be that. And yeah. this goes back to causality. So I, I, I love everything that I'm learning about karma from you. And I, I haven't really, I, I used to think about karma in terms of causality. And now I'm starting to reassess my understanding of it in terms of, of how it relates to density. Yeah, it's density. Um, you could say a sin is density too. Because that's exactly the, the narrative. That's exactly how they use it in the Bible. They say we're born with sin. And they, in Buddhism and Dharmic religion, we're born with karma. And karma is density. It's actually is considered sin by the higher beings as well. You know, karma or any higher being. They say uh, karma is, a, uh, is an evil thing that attaches to you. And you, know, you have to relinquish yourself of it by spiritual and virtuous practice. Uh, which is which lightens up you know your body through you know the non-physical the changes must happen within the non-physical first before it gets to the physical you, you get what i mean That's how yeah you care, right? your consciousness and your yourself eventually your body your physical self you get lighter, Love it. more uh transparent as well you become actually almost see-through if you get to <laughs> you get to that level of practice that some monks do so I, I have to share with you guys, and then I'm going to ask uh, Halima a question. Um, so you were yeah. talking about density, and it just dawned on me. The correlation between density and destiny. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I just I just I just typed them out. As, unless my spelling is off, they have the same letters. There's yeah. just a, re a rearrangement of the letters. And I feel, uh, I used to think about my destiny not necessarily having a, a, a final destination. So I like to think of this journey as um, an endless uh, opportunity to, to learn more and to rediscover things that we already know. I, I, I'm finding the more aware I become, the less surprised I am, and yet the more amazed I am also being because I, I'm just finding more humor in things. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the ability to, to understand and know that everything that's meant to occur happens for a reason and therefore every event the, the 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 possibility of every event that occurs in our experience is exactly 100 percent so again I'll, I'll go quantum just for uh, a, a few more seconds yeah, the three properties of the wave include amplitude wavelength and frequency um, wavelength and frequency are directly related. They have an inverse relationship. The more powerful the energy, the shorter the wavelength and the faster that it oscillates. And you would think that if the wavelength shortens, you're actually missing out on something. It's just data compression. You talked about compression earlier. So as yeah. the wavelength shortens, uh -huh. yeah. it's just being compressed. Now the amplitude is, is basically the intensity of the signal. And the, the, the more intense the signal, the greater the chance that the event will be observed. So the detection is the observation. And there is only the probability of when it will occur. Not, And this just now dawned on me. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. So mm -hmm. probability of any event occurring is determined by the willingness of the observant student and their ability to 
manifest that event or to make that event basically actualized or realized and therefore manifested. Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's where my mind goes. Um, Halim, um, what are the benefits of practicing any martial art from your perspective? Okay, so as far as the benefit, there's, there's a lot and it really, it goes back to where the mind of the practitioner is, right? So what, what you are observing or what you're seeking is often what you end up arriving to find. So it's, it's a difficult one to answer from a definite standpoint, but I think from my experience, one of the things that martial arts really brings to the table is that you are exploring your potential. And if we're looking at the idea of how to manifest something, and it goes into the practice of the spirituality, it also goes into the, the more magical aspects of, of our tradition, is understanding the process of creation, understanding what the what steps and stages and cycles exist within this process and in martial arts you have you have a specific end result that becomes a necessity right we're assuming that uh if we're talking about classical classical martial arts you're assuming that your life is in danger so it's not a, it's not a desire in terms of you know i don't want to uh, and again, the warrior cultures that this come from, that this came from, it wasn't a matter of survivability for themselves because they didn't fear the death for themselves. It was mm. a matter of service. Because awesome. if I'm standing here in front of a, um, if our forces are standing as a barrier between those that we love, we do the training, we do the practice, we do the exercises, and we prepare ourselves to face challenges that the others are unable to face. And so the zeal that gets put into our practice is for the sake of service, because if I don't succeed, then it isn't about my suffering. It's about the suffering of the women, the children, the elderly, and everyone else that is unable to defend themselves or is unable to. So now it's a matter of service, right? And, and so now you, you have a little bit of motivation, but even still, you can't hold that as a, as a desire and attachment in your mind or you're, you're likely to fail. There's a samurai saying that says, he who clings to life surely finds death. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concept here is if you think of the psyche and the games it plays, when I have a strong desire to want to win, then I'm likely to try to think of creative outlets to try to ensure that that happens without working on myself. And that's where the problem lies, is they think they can find shortcuts mm -hmm. and the shortcuts end up leading them to their very doom. And so this is the same with the spiritual practices where with my students, I often tell them, you know, you can take the short, long path or the long, short path, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the long, short path is you do things the right way. You dedicate the time to the practices as they're meant to be. And in the long run, it makes your journey rather quick. Or you can take the short, long path where you're trying to find every shortcut. You're trying to cut corners. You're trying to find a quick hack to try to get to some state because you think that that's the end result. Cheat. Yeah. And in the end, you prolong your journey by who knows how long. And so we see these parallels and it's just put in a different context. But what I think happens is that these different situations that we have are, are all form. The essence doesn't change. The essence is always a matter of, you know, the process of bringing something to completion. And it's the, it's the creative process that existence itself goes through. So if I were to ask you, what is the opposite of death? What would you say? My intuition would say life. That's uh, what I, most people say. Right, right. 
what 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 is uh what is your definition of death so that's an interesting thing first of all it, as far as the opposite of death it would actually be birth and the Ooh. reason being i love it i love it no it's they're right. both transitions aren't they exactly that's you perfect. see birth is the moment that we come into existence in this form death is the moment that we leave so there are two gateways life itself is what travels through that gateway and it doesn't stop its travels right it didn't stop when it entered it won't stop when it exits this particular form so when we're looking at what is life life we can experience uh, it, it, we can explain as a, the operative experience of consciousness and if mm. that's true then birth and death are necessary transitions to move from one place to another. And we're talking about why different dimensions are the way they are. You ever play with a radio or a, you look at frequencies of light, there's a moment of distortion mm -hmm. between one and another. And there's, in traditions, there's different numbers of realms and dimensions, but it's really defining, there's some key ones that are all the same. But it's like saying how many colors are there you know we can we can simplify to certain major colors but then even if i just say red or blue well how many different shades of red and blue right you know are in between so yeah. that's 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 what i would say about life existence and, and death as being the shedding of the shell that contains our our life essence um, and, and going back to, uh, and, and that is such a brilliant connection, um, the, uh, the opposite of, of, of death is not, li is not life, it is birth. Now, what is your definition of, of when birth actually occurs? I'm starting to think it's at the moment of conception where there is a perfect uh, reunification of First, the idea of, uh, let's say, a new life, and then the manifestation of the physicality where, in the case of a human, the sperm and the ovum can combine. Um, right. is, is your, when, when does birth occur? So that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting one because you have a bit of a sliding scale, at least in, in, from what I can see. Because um, what we tend to think of is we're trying to measure when consciousness begins to happen. And, and that's a little problematic because there's nothing that exists if not for consciousness. So if that mm -hmm. were true, then conception has always been, will always be, and never stops. Right? So we can't <laughs> define the moment, right? <laughs> well, we can, we can certainly try, but you're right. You, you, the, the whole thing, and it goes back to, to quantum mechanics, you you can you can define an event, but the moment is is moving, momentum, uh, and again, there's another connection. Mo the moment yeah. is an expression of the combination of physicality and non physicality, where space and time are one, and yet there's never a lack of motion per se outside of the nothingness which even that is only temporary and that goes back to the whole idea of impermanence david i have to ask and i i i, I can only imagine um if you hadn't already seen and felt the connections between buddhism and the, the practice of martial arts, um, what, what is your, uh, what say you in regards to that relationship? Oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of martial arts myself. I, I never really got into it because uh, I got into other things when I was in, you know, high school and stuff, sports and, you know, but I never really got to experience martial arts. I've always been a fan of it. I watched the movies and I've studied some, some of their, uh, philosophy and not not I didn't get too deep into it but a lot of these martial arts they incorporate Buddhist uh, disciplines as actually is mm -hmm. actually um, 
martial arts can almost can almost be a, seen as a way as a or a, a gateway into further consciousness actually because uh, they incorporate a lot of these same doctrines and disciplines into their own philosophy and it's, what comes out of it is beautiful i think the movement that's how it and, happened for me oh yeah right right it's yeah it's actually, i was a martial artist right? first okay okay sweet oh so then you uh you further expanded your knowledge into consciousness after yeah yeah right. i think it's i think it's pretty cool i think it's was absolutely um uh, uh necessary in the you know the, those parts of the world during those times you know they, yes yeah they're you know they're dealing with a lot of uh aggression from neighbors and mm -hmm. people in their society yeah so it's really necessary it's, i think it's a beautiful thing but eventually um when when we become you know a more enlightened and less violent less aggressive society martial arts will eventually fade out you know and, it it is i think uh, uh, and the reason why I, I love that it's called arts, martial arts, it, it does, I think, serve a, a very unique function in that it takes what people tend to fear the most. So people tend to fear dying. They tend to fear uh, experiencing physical pain, for example. Um, if you've never been in a fight, and I think this might even be a quote from Fight Club, if, if you can't ever really know more about yourself until you're in a fight. And I used to get into a lot of fights as a kid. I, uh, as, as, as a kid in grade school, um, I was skinny. I wore glasses. I loved school. I was a total nerd. And kids would think that it was their job to pick on me. And, um, you know, I, I, I never, I never, uh, I don't think I've ever lost a fight. I think one time I did. And even that I don't consider a loss because I, I learned something from it. Um, what, what, I, what I learned from those experiences as, as a youth is that um, what I was protecting was not my physical body. It was, it was my spirit. It was my free will. Uh, and this, the, the human spirit is free will because we all at least want to believe that we have the ability to choose the experiences. Nobody, I mean, I, I, I suppose, uh, and, and I could be wrong in this. I don't think anybody wants to think that they are a slave to, you know, let's say a religion or a government or, or even uh, uh, a sort of God that is, is wrathful, for example. I do think that people crave levels of certainty. So if people become comfortable in let's say being certain that they will be safe if they comply with certain regulations and mandates, for example, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get too political here, but um, I, I, I value freedom over safety. Uh, what say you, Halim, in regards to that? Well, we can actually see this as a study of human behavior where the, the less a person feels capable of governing themselves the more they seek to be governed and mm. so there is a direct correlation between a person's capacity to be in charge of the needs and and the situations that arise in their life and their ability to explore freedom mm. it's when they feel that they're unable that they start to seek someone else to take the the, the load of responsibility off of their shoulders dependence that's it. It's dependent. So it's, it's, it goes, the beliefs are how they justify it, right? So what ends up happening is that I believe that this is their motive. I believe this is what's going to happen as a result. But belief implies by its very nature that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice way of saying, I'm guessing and I'm hoping. And there's nothing wrong with hope, obviously. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong to make a guess. 
However, the conversation leads people away from realizing that what, what we should do is refocus on how to develop our capacity. And if we could develop our capacity, we do not need the governance from outside because yes. you can self-govern. Yes. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. David, let me ask you this. With all that we're talking about in regards to martial arts, as well as spiritual practices, whether it be Buddhism or Sikhism, or really any uh, spiritual faith, or school of thought for that matter, um, including scientific fields of study, what is your impression of the power of the belief system with this little piece of information that was presented to me a couple of years ago by a friend who is a strict determinist and even said that he that he he told me I'm not going I'm going to hate what he has to say about determinism because he knew that I am more of a free will agent. Um, so this is, this is the idea. A belief is paradoxical. All beliefs are paradoxical because they are only partially true. So with, with that concept in mind, what is your understanding as far as the power or the benefits of the belief system in relation to how we process information? Well, it could, also, it's, it could be a double-edged sword because... It depends on what you are believing in, actually. In terms of religion, uh, there's a, there's so many different religions that qualify that had you know the many realms of existence in their own language, in their own descriptions and definitions as well. So, well, I mean, but they all have a common thread. But the whole point of the whole belief system is to kind of remind you that this ain't the actual reality. There are higher realms and lower realms too. Um, it kind of is the belief in religious system is designed to, uh, well, the good, the good religions, at least, uh, designed to help you ascend to higher realms, because that's exactly what it takes. It takes uh, devotion, it takes faith, and faith in all things that are good, in righteousness, in virtues, in heaven in nirvana you know the belief that hell does exist or kind of prevents you and not wanting to go that route or anything yeah. to do with that route or attach any thoughts feelings or words to that were uh realm of existence um and i do study all the major religions and they, they do have they do confirm heaven and hell does exist so it's my own belief that yes this these realms are actually in existence mm -hmm. now, sure to believe, and and Oh, sorry, what? No, no, no. I was just going to say, so so the yeah. beliefs that you have help you maintain sort of the free, the, the, the energies of these possibilities, and yeah. they do it's sort of uh, help guide, guide your, your actions. Is that safe yeah. to say? That's very safe to say. It's a guideline. It's a discipline, pretty much. And it's a, it's a guideline. It's a set of rules. Beliefs, yeah. Because beliefs in, in itself, they're all, they're limited too. You know, the word belief in it, when it, the word, words in itself, they're, they're actually constructs of the nothingness. Everything to, to believe, to perceive, to, 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 to do everything. I mean, to, to do anything with the physical realm is to come into existence of it. Okay, so I'm, I'm of the understanding is existence and matter and physicality is actually suffering. That's that's how I ever understand reality is because when we come into existence, we're actually given forms and forms, uh, depending on which realm you're in, higher or lower, you are limited to only, you know, two hands, two feet, you know, feelings, you know, sight is only available through the eyes, smell only through the nose, hearing only through the, you know, and in other realms you can perceive, you have these, super expanded sensory skills or uh, abilities that go beyond what the physical body actually is. So that's my understanding of uh, how belief would affect or <clears throat> existence, anything that comes into existence and belief in itself to me is coming into existence with physicality uh, 
And the whole point of Buddhism is to come become the non-physical, which is, you know, nirvana. So belief is a, yeah, it's a guide. It's only a guide, but you know, eventually when you reach to you know the higher states, you're gonna have to let go of all concepts. Okay? Yes. Yes. Concept yes. in itself is a construct, you know, and then it goes to language, language. Every word carries energy and uh, energy of creation. Especially where I mean uh, words that already have definition, they carry meaning. So they once they carry meaning, you know, people especially with people that don't understand certain verbiage and terminology, it starts to create formations in their heads, thoughts. When you when you create formations in your mind, you you're pretty much manifesting uh, after that, after that, when you believe it, you're manifesting. Yeah. Um I love everything that you guys are saying, and I'm actually, um, I, I, I came up with two new articles that I'm going to write about. Uh, one of them is uh, Density, Destiny, and then this, uh, this other one that just came to mind. Uh, because of what you were saying, by the way, um, in regards to belief, um, be life and be leaf have exactly the same letters. A lot of people have a tendency to um, extrapolate the word lie and they say oh belief is a lie well it can be but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way um halim what is what is your understanding of beliefs and how they relate to having faith that's a really good one um so beliefs versus faith the biggest difference between the two is the relationship and, and i'll explain so the beliefs is, when we're beginning on a path and there's just so much that we don't know somebody has to guide us right and so one of the only ways that we can really get guidance and to understand how that guidance works is usually transmitted as a form of belief right and there's nothing wrong with that until we stop the seeking and that the belief was meant to lead us to. And so we have these things that we're, that we're exploring and the exploration of it is, is more of a question than an answer, right? So belief tends to be offered as an answer. Here's what I believe, mm. but it's meant, to, it's meant to motivate the question. So this is what we're seeking and this is what the belief is now, let me find it for myself. Let me experience mm. it for myself. So the belief of whether there is a heaven or a hell in, in my personal practice is a little irrele irre irrelevant unless I'm able to experience it for myself. Mm -hmm. and, and these are practices that we take to uh, elevate our awareness to the place where these heaven realms are and go into the hell realms as well. And what you realize uh, at a certain point is that you can't go anywhere if you don't in some way already exist there. Otherwise you would have to go through the birthing process. And if you didn't go through the birthing process, that means you were already there. So it's just a matter of expanding your consciousness to realize the aspect of you that exists there. So we're in all of it all the time. It's just a matter of where is our actual perception at any given time. And the practices are meant to take us from one place to another, but the belief is what gives us a framework of how all of this is structured, how it works and what we can, what we can and cannot do, but it's meant to be something that we pick up and explore. And then faith, the best way that I could explain faith would be in a very human and very personal way. Um, if, a person that you're very connected to, a person that you've that you've developed uh, a long-standing trust with, if they say to you that if you need X, Y, Z, let me know, I'll make it happen. And over time, it has always been the case. You may not understand how it's going to happen. You may not have a clue how they do what they do or how it's even possible. But because of the relationship and the experience behind that relationship, there's a faith. And so this is where, when we begin to touch upon the mystery of, of existence and the intelligence that exists behind it, that will communicate to you through every 
experience, mm. people will carry these messages. You have partial revelations in, in your internal experiences of meditations and vision work. And then people will be filling in uh, uh, gaps or answering questions that you never voiced. It's the intelligence behind all of creation communicating to you, using these people as vessels to, to actually fill uh, those, those gaps that you're looking to fill. And, and over time, that creates a certain kind of faith where there's no question. It's not really a belief at, that, at this point because it, it's not a mental phenomenon of thinking that I think mm. this is the case. Yes, faith yes. Faith is the knowing. Faith yes. is, it implies that I, I'm connected and I have a knowing. I may not understand it, but I do, I do have the knowing and the connection that it will take place. Trust. It comes down to yes. a level of trust, I think. So, so we can, for example, um, believe in God, but if we don't have faith that God has our best interests at heart, then we are going to be more fearful. So I, I like to think of faith as sort of a balancing act between, between being fearful and faithful. So we are not meant to be absolutely fearful fearless because without those moments of fear we're not going to be disturbed enough to pay attention to the experience we sometimes have to be like hey pay attention you know so our instincts kick in the the the, the flight or fight response um, is is a very real physical phenomenon where your heart will race your body will release in, uh, uh, endorphins and epinephrine uh, or, or adrenaline, another name for adrenaline, and you're going to have this this cocktail of uh, biochemical responses that is going to give you the energy to either stand your ground and or take off. So uh, it seems to me like we exercise our free will by using the belief system, using our perceptual lens to interpret the information and always maintain as le however amount of faith we require to at least be certain enough that our reality matters and that we matter so that we just continue to either survive, live, or eventually learn how to thrive what is what is your take david on just just the concept of faith and how it relates to your experiences what what is what is your interpretation of what faith is uh, simple for me faith is pretty much trust you know you trust the information that you've been given or you've come across through study or personal experience through physical interaction or observation through your mind or, or uh, reflection, you know, you, that's what faith pretty much is. Well, faith in, in itself, I mean, it's kind of, it kind of means that you, you know, you're, you have trust in something that you don't quite have absolute cert certainty of, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what faith actually kind of means, but, uh, I like to see it as trust when you trust what you actually uh, believe and practice and are experiencing. Uh, that's, that's how faith will in religion. When you have faith, you trust the word of God or the, or the word of the Buddha, everything he's saying, you have faith that it's true. And, you know, you follow it, you believe it, you, you have indoctrinated it inside your consciousness. Now it's a part of your consciousness and you, you know, your every being that's uh, that's what, faith actually does to you too um it changes you it transforms you you know without faith you're you know you're stuck you're actually you're absolutely <laughs> stuck actually i mean in terms of spiritual practice at least you know you have to have faith in your guru your master your teacher but you know your your central figure in whatever uh religion or practice you study so it's trust it's trust yeah for me at least yeah Without, without, the, without, the, without the trust, you're not going to uh, believe that what they are doing is right. for your benefit. 
And yeah. when that trust is broken, when that trust is broken, um, it seems like that would be um, maybe a, a good time to part ways. And that well, no, goes back to the end, you. The best teacher is yourself in the end. You know, you are the, you what, are the best that? teacher. Oh, no, in the end, yes. the best teacher is yourself in the yes end, after you've you've matured and progressed um the best teacher is always going to be yourself yeah and i agree only, only you could verify and qualify and quantify so that you yourself could understand things someone could tell you someone could show you the way someone could reveal to you the secrets but it's up to you to how you interpret it that information so you and your you are the translator you are the transfigurator you are you are the judge of things of the information that comes your way and you are the processor as well mm -hmm. the consciousness is like i said it can't be qualified so, uh, that's what we are the consciousness so, yeah. be, being a, a musician and a composer um i like to think of myself as as being not only the conductor of the music but also the composer and and the musician all at once so yeah. it seems like this this whole experience here on earth and that's the name of my first book by the way um why are we here on earth which is part of the sight sound spirit trilogy and um it's due out mid to late june so i'm totally looking forward to that and how many books I, you got? I'm in the practice and discipline of, I have 10 books going. Um, oh, I crazy. have four, I have four, I have four of them completed. Um, nice. I am, it's funny. I, I tend to start a new book before I finish previous books, just because of what my mind is thinking. So the, um, the next trilogy that will be completed um, soon uh, is called Connect Ions, so Connections. And the three titles are The Science of Spirituality, The Psychology of Religion, and The Philosophy of Faith. And then the next two books I started writing in November, and it's very simple. Um, it's called, I'm going to call it, ooh, I think I'm going to call it IO. And I'm going to uh, relate um, everything uh, on a basis of it being information or, or data. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it look like a one and a zero um, uh, or, or maybe, maybe uh, X, you know, uh, uh, there's just so many different things that I can do with this. I might do, I might do X and one, which... I, I guess would be uh, the Roman numeral for 11 because my life path is 11. I think that's what I'm going to do. And, and uh, the, two, uh, the two books, um, one of the titles is The Quantification of Spirituality, and the other one is The Qualification of Physicality. And after... <clears throat> Um, and, and not too long ago, I came up with two new titles. One of them is Observations, and all of my uh, current writings about consciousness are falling there. And then the two new uh, titles that I came up with today, um, uh, Density, Destiny, and um, Belief, are, Be Life, Belief, are going to be part of the book called Reflections. So this is... Uh, my life work as a philosopher is um, going to be the completion of these 10 books that will occur um, within the year. Just oh, knowing gonna, um, how much I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Oh no, you're, you're going to finish all those in, within the year or what? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because I write, I write um, on average 500 to 1500 words a day. So um, I'm just constantly, constantly writing and in the discipline of doing so. And um, what I, what I want to do uh, after that is, is delve into science fiction stuff. So I'm not going to stop writing, but I'm going to 
just take a, a different path. Um, let me ask um, everyone to sort of give uh, final thoughts. Uh, I want to wrap up this day, uh, this wonderful conversation, uh, knowing and hoping that we will have more with the the two of you. And um, I just, gosh, I, you know, I I I woke up today deciding that I'm going to have the greatest day of my life, and it it's happening. I'm I'm just honored to be here. I'm thrilled to exchange information with both of you gentlemen. Um, Halim, give me sort of just your final thoughts, take as much time as you need and uh, go ahead and just share more info. All right, well, uh, yeah, I look forward to more of these as well. Um, there's, it, it's, it's great to have open discussions with people uh, about these topics, especially when it gets into the, beyond the superficial. So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to be a part of it. Um, as far as final thoughts, uh, I've had a few conversations before with David and uh, I think that we're, we're coming to a time where this, this understanding of this harmonization between our everyday living and the spiritual living um we're i think we're finding that in masks we're, we're we have more and more people looking to bridge the gap and both have always existed but it was almost so polarized where you had the spiritual lifestyle and it almost shuns the everyday layman lifestyle and then the layman lifestyle is so far removed from the spiritual lifestyle that they they they'll take guidance from but they're going to do their own thing and i think what we're finding is that 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 gap is beginning to bridge and i and this is just a, a a thought and david i think that's something that maybe you can speak on uh, is when you look at the 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 teachings and the idea of the future buddha right the maitreya the idea is that it's going to be in the people now you can take that rather literally and say that it is within all of us now so the removal of the individual, uh, the individual savior archetype, and moving that into the collective, where we find it within ourselves, right? Now, I, I'm not saying that that's a definitive, but I think that that's a direction that we see in people today. So bringing these authentic methods, which, in my time looking at what has been out there there is a, a drastic confusion of the spiritual traditions, what the spiritual traditions meant by what they said, the practices that they, they take and why they take them. The common conversation for the people who are seeking this are, are, are they're interpreting all of these things in a very specific way that leads them to um, interesting places, we'll put it like that. And, I think that what it's important for those who have the capacity and the ability to bridge these gaps to actually step into that role. And as far as the roles of, of any kind of teacher or guide or anything like that, it's, it's meant to be like a ladder. You know, I may need the ladder to get to the roof, but I don't carry it around on my back when I'm on there, right? If I try to carry the ladder on my back as I'm walking around on the roof, it's probably going to lead to catastrophe. So I think that teachers are meant to be like that. It leads you somewhere, but you're meant to leave them behind. And mm -hmm. I look forward to a time when we as humanity are able to leave the ladders behind and find the truth wow. for ourselves. I love that. Wow. Well said. I, I, perfect. Namaste. Thank you for ah, wow. Thank you, thank you. David, um, and take, right. as long as, take as long as you like, because I, I'm, I'm not in a rush for time. I just feel like um, uh, yeah, there's the more that I would like to discuss at another time. And, and yeah. I, I do want to get into Taoism with you, uh, gentlemen. Maybe that can be the, the topic of discussion uh, next time around. Uh, David, what are your thoughts about everything that we talked about today? It was great. We we you know revisited a couple subjects and uh, talked about some new subjects too. This whole thing, this whole series, is great to me because there's a lot of people that need to be more aware 
of how consciousness and how the realms of existence come in, come into being. So um, instead of having to you know date the scriptures for yourself, we got some people that's been studying for years already, just able to explain it, you know, off the top of their head, which is a which is great. I mean, that doesn't mean you don't have to. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean you don't have to uh, continue studying and stop studying. You should still continue mm -hmm. because this is just a summary of what we studied the whole time for many, many years. It's a compression of all these disinformation, but all it all makes sense though. I mean, it all correlates. It all there's there's parallels in every single thing that we talk about and do in our everyday lives, and all of a sudden it all goes back to consciousness. So mm -hmm. we're kind of at a point in uh humanity where science and spirituality is converging especially yes. quantum, quantum physics you know and so now people are starting to realize that what these guys and what these religions have been talking about is actually true <laughs> you know it, they didn't have scientific terminology you know, 500 years ago uh you know what i mean there's so many more words now to uh, to qualify and quantify certain things and yes. describe what they were talking about now. So it's, the, it's actually the perfect age to reveal these ancient teachings and disciplines. Uh, you know, we, I, I trust that everything you guys are coming, you know, saying pretty much you guys, it's, it's all based on research, observation, and yes. qualification. So thank you for having us. Uh, uh, pleasure to be here with uh, Halim as well. And, Especially you, uh, Michael. So it's my third. No, time. you guys, I, I'm so like blown away. I, the, the, what I'm feeling right now, um, I mean, if, if Nirvana is somehow even more um, enlightening than what I'm currently feeling, I mean, gosh, so much the better. If, if I, I, I sort of had this, uh, not sort of, I, while doing my presentation earlier, I had a revelation and um, I even got a little teary eyed and the, the amount of gratitude that I am currently feeling is basically, the only way I can describe it is if nothing happens from this point of time on, or if everything that I've thought about is off by 180 degrees, I am perfectly peaceful and at ease with either possibility. And it, and it, it is not even really a matter of acceptance and yet it is because i'm i'm letting i'm learning how to let go of preconceived um thoughts about what i think something will feel like or should feel like and now it's a matter of becoming just present in my moment whenever I am aware of that moment. So the more aware of any given moment that we can become, and 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 the word uh, moment, I love it. Yeah, uh, it has it has yeah. ohm in it. I, I I don't know if you guys ever thought about that, but ohm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> man, that that yeah. sound, ohm. I just yeah. boom. It's home. We're already home. Yeah. We just have to uh, re remember that. We never left. <laughs> we, yeah. we've, we had to we, withdraw from the physical back to the non-physical. Yes, yeah. we had to, we had to uh, become physical beings in order to understand the actual state of existence, which is spiritual and non-physical. Yeah. So a lot of people have this idea that um, they are physical beings experiencing um spiritual reality and then other people will have this idea that they are spiritual beings experiencing physical reality both uh, are valid both make sense and whatever makes sense to the observant student is what they require in order to be more certain of the reality so the uh 
the only thing again, and I, I said this before, the only thing that I personally know for absolute certainty is how I am currently feeling. Everything else is going to be icing on the cake. It's going to be information. It's going to be energy. It's going to be uh, uh, an opportunity to process and get a deeper understanding of my relationship with the universe. And yes, it's all, it's all related back to consciousness. So consciousness not only creates its own reality, I believe that consciousness is simply experiencing itself. And all there ever actually was, is, or will be, is consciousness. So wrap your, wrap your brain around that and, and contemplate that and then think about what you guys would like to discuss next time around. I would love to discuss Taoism if you guys are up for that. But um, I also mm-hmm. am learning that sometimes. Alim. Alim's field what, right there. He, he knows about Taoism. Awesome. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. 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 You guys, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. your, your very kind <sighs> energy and the focus, paying attention and listening and learning and teaching uh, all sort of in a simultaneous uh unification of of this one shared reality that we are currently experiencing so thank you guys and with that i'm going to say thank you for anybody that is going to listen and learn and namaste all right have a good one guys bye bye guys